Um, artificial intelligence. Well, that's just a machine that exhibits cognitive or decision-making behavior and can take action to achieve a goal. Okay, so that's a very basic definition here. Okay, so um, now if we were to further break this down, um, some people, when I say artificial intelligence, are gonna think about the movies, right? So you've seen Ex Machina, you've seen uh, 2001, you've seen The Terminator, all these things that represent some form of artificial intelligence that's often malevolent or bad. And uh, usually those systems have some sort of general AI, okay? So that is where we have a machine that can actually reason and adapt like a human. Okay, so you and I, we can be talking about a certain subject at one point, and then we can talk about a different subject. We have intelligence in multiple areas. We can think about things in multiple different ways. We can be talking about money. We can then be talking about art. We can then be talking about literature. We can talk about business. We have intelligence that moves across multiple domains. Okay. So that's what we call general AI. We're not there yet. And if you have used Siri or any of these other um, voice enabled uh, assistants, you know that uh, they're kind of narrow. They can tell you what the weather is. They can tell you certain things. They can maybe read a poem to you, uh, but they've been kind of programmed with that intelligence. So they don't really translate into other areas. Now, narrow AI, uh, is where we see most of this. So I'm gonna go at a very basic level and some AI experts would disagree with me on this. But if you think about the technology of a Roomba, okay, these are little um, robots that will clean your floors for you. Um, uh, so these little robots will roam around and if they hit something, they turn and they move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right and they hit something and they move a little bit more, okay? But it does kind of make a little decision. But that decision has been programmed by somebody, right? So we could imagine writing a program that says, if you hit wall, uh, turn 10 degrees, then go forward again, see what happens. If you hit another wall, turn another 10 degrees, so on and so forth. And so uh, when, what's really interesting is when we get beyond actually programming it. So when we don't have to program these systems, um, we can then really expand what we can have these computers do. So there's this whole area called machine learning. That's a subset of artificial intelligence. And so let me just put some definitions up here as well. Machine learning's goal is to develop predictions based on previously observed patterns. So some of you that have had statistics know that we could probably do that with like a regression analysis. And that's some machine learning algorithms are beta based on that technology. But in these uh, machine learning algorithms, various variables are weighed to predict the probabilities of an outcome. Okay, so the variables and formulas can be programmed by a human Okay, so we can sit there and program them by hand, or we can actually, uh, uh, there we go, uh, we can actually give our machines some tools by which they can actually learn themselves. So they can be given a lot of training, some training data, and they can actually then learn themselves how to recognize, for example, differences, okay? So uh, that's where a lot of the interest lies. Let's think about an app that might just simply recognize money, okay? So let's say we wanted to build an app for our phone and it would be uh, an app that would recognize money and uh, we could sit down and program this, right? So uh, Mr. Rose and I could sit there and we could uh, program, okay, well, it has to have a, I'm using US uh, dollars here rather than Ron's, but um, it just has to have a five up here. It has to have this guy named Abraham Lincoln. He kind of looks like this. We'd program all that uh, and we'd program it for the 
perfect $5 bill, but then we'd have to do it for when the $5 bill is this way, is that way, is crumpled up, all that kind of stuff. But what if instead, that sounds like a lot of work, right? Uh, you know, yes. And as Homer Simpson already said, if, it, if it's, uh, if it's uh, hard, it's, it's not worth doing. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, but uh, that would be really difficult to do something like that, right? So what Thomas and I might do instead is we might imbue our computer with the ability to recognize some patterns on its own and then just show it a whole bunch of $5 bills, of $20 bills, and so on. Um, now I'm going to try this here and, and uh, we'll see if this works. It's always a little bit of a watch my dog do this trick, I call it, because when you are uh, trying to demo something uh, online, it sometimes doesn't, uh, doesn't always work the way you want it to. But uh, I'm going to show you an app that does exactly what I'm talking about here. So this is a little app. Short from... tip, RZXX tip currency. Um, this is a short app, uh, an app you can download called Seeing AI from Microsoft. And I'll give you a link to all the apps and stuff that I show you. And that's exactly what it does. So I have my $5 bill here. Five US dollars. And it says that's five US dollars. And 20 US dollars. And I don't know if hopefully you heard that, it said 20 US dollars. Okay, so that's exactly the type of thing that you can do with a machine learning algorithm. So this deep learning algorithm actually is able to learn on its own, okay, just by simply giving it lots of examples, okay, lots of different types of data. Now it's interesting because that data can be um, all sorts of things, okay, so it could be motion data, it could be audio or voice data, uh, it could be imaging data, uh, it could be text data, geospatial data, where we're actually at in the world, uh, medical data, uh, financial data, or behavioral data. Now, some of you may know that social media uses machine learning algorithms to try and keep you engaged. Okay, well, that's what they're doing is they're looking at your behavior. So they're saying, oh, if I feed Scott these certain images and algorithms, he will tend to set, stay engaged on the platform, okay? So the way that this works, and we may try and try this by the end of the uh, seminar here, is fairly simple. And you can actually do this without having a lot of um, advanced math or uh, computer science skills nowadays. nowadays. What you do is you actually collect your training data. So we need to collect lots and lots of images of our $5 bills and our $20 bills. And we need to label those. We need to make sure that data is properly labeled. Um, then we will segment that data. So we will kind of chunk it up into little segments. And um, we'll do maybe a little bit of analysis of that data. And then we will train what's called a neural network. Now a neural network is not the same as a human brain, but it has some basic ideas uh, that have been kind of stolen or, or have been borrowed from the idea of how, how a brain works. So we have interconnections between different neurons. And so in fact, we call these nodes within a neural network, we call them neurons. Um, and this is a way that we can train this algorithm or this computer um, using this neural network to be able to recognize patterns, okay? And uh, then we actually test that. So we wanna test it out. We get a whole bunch of $2 and $20 bills and $10 bills and, and so forth and so on. And we'd wanna test that. And we wanna see, okay, is this really accurate? Um, for example, let's say that we did give it a $10 euro or 10, 10 euro bill, if you will. And uh, we want to then uh, see, well, does it recognize that that is not a US dollar? Okay, we wouldn't want to have it overclassify something and to always select um, a US currency. Okay, so we would test that out and then we could actually deploy that. 
So uh, these neural networks are kind of interesting. They generally have a uh, input layer uh, and they have an output layer. So the input layer is the image data in this case, this example I've been using. Uh, the output layer are all the different types of things we want it to identify. So case one, case two, case three, case four. So that might be our $1 bill, our $5 bill, our $10 bill, and our $20 bill. So what we do is we actually um, feed in these inputs. The machine learning algorithm knows that this is an image of a $5 bill. And so therefore it needs to end up in case two or, or whatever particular case it is. And it will then uh, train itself. So it actually goes through a, a series of training sessions, if you will, to strengthen the connections between these different nodes or neurons in the network. Um, there's kind of a statistical model that, that happens here, and you can learn more about that if you want to. It's not too hard to uh, learn if you know some basic statistics. But uh, basically what it does is it assures that when we put in an image of a $5 bill, that it will always kind of flow through this network in a way that it will always end up at the right case. Okay, so it trains itself sometimes hundreds or thousands of times. Now I mentioned that there's kind of this input layer and the, there's this output layer, but in between here are what we call the hidden layers. Okay, so um, in some ways these are, all these interconnections are a little bit mysterious to us in some ways because we're just allowing the computer to make those connections. So we'll talk about why that can be problematic, uh, why, um, why we might want to know what it's actually doing in these hidden layers. Now this example up here just shows three of these hidden layers or deep learning layers, but we could have hundreds of them. Okay, so you can imagine a very complicated um, algorithm that is uh, sorting through lots of different types of data and may have hundreds and hundreds of uh, layers in them. Now I will tell you, I'm gonna be uh, straightforward here. Normally I would have us actually train a uh, neural net, but I, the site I normally use for that says right now that it's down for temporary maintenance. So we're going to move ahead a little bit in the lecture, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna see if we can actually train a neural network ourselves, okay? It's not too hard to do that because all we have to do is do these four steps. We have to collect the training data. We have to analyze and segment it. Uh, we set up our neural network and we test and deploy that. What's really interesting about this is that I can uh, do all this stuff in the cloud, right? I can do this on servers that are out there uh, in the cloud somewhere on the internet, uh, and it will train that neural network. But once that neural network is trained, I can download it into my app. Yeah, that's exactly what Microsoft did with this. Uh, it doesn't, my phone is not the computer that got trained on this, okay? Uh, it's the computer that's using that once that model is built. So building the model and using the model can be separated. In fact, I have here, and I know, I'm pretty sure that University of Western Cape uses something similar. They use either Raspberry Pis or they might use this little tiny thing called a micro bit that's also very popular in Europe. It's basically a small little uh, computer. It's probably about $10, $15 US. Um, and it allows children to learn about uh, how to program. Okay, so it's really used um, a, a lot in education. But I can actually train a neural network and I can then download it to something like this. Okay, very cheap, uh, very uh, inexpensive and easily deployable, very small device. Okay, so um, this is not just happening on those big supercomputers or data centers. We might use those to train our neural network, but then we can incorporate that once it's trained into our systems, okay? Uh, and if you do have questions as we go along, um, put them in the chat or um, I'll try and take a little break uh, as well.
But let's uh, go ahead and, uh, as I said, we'll come back and see if we can actually train a neural network uh, in a minute. But let's go ahead and let's actually look at some of the applications of this. Okay, so image data is a very popular way to use machine learning. Because if you think about a lot of image data, what we're looking for is patterns. And so machine learning is very good at pattern recognition. Okay, that's uh, something that's excellent at. Um, and I wanna share a, a little video here with you um, that is about how this is being used in medicine. Dear fellow scholars, this is Two Minute Papers with Karo Jolna Ifehir. In this work, a 121 layer convolutional neural network is trained to recognize pneumonia and 13 different diseases. Pneumonia is an inflammatory lung condition that is responsible for a million hospitalizations and 50,000 deaths per year in the US alone. Such an algorithm requires a training set of formidable size to work properly. This means a bunch of input-output pairs. In this case, one training sample is an input frontal x-ray image of the chest and the outputs are annotations by experts who mark which of the 14 sought diseases are present in this sample. So they say like, this image contains pneumonia here and this doesn't. This is not just a binary yes or no answer, but a more detailed heat map of possible regions that fit the diagnosis. The training set used for this algorithm contained over 100,000 images of 30,000 patients. This is then given to the neural network and its task is to learn the properties of these diseases by itself. Then, after the learning process took place, previously unseen images are given to the algorithm and a set of radiologists. This is called a test set and of course it is crucial that both the training and the test sets are reliable. If the training and test set is created by one expert radiologist and then we again benchmark a neural network against a different randomly picked radiologist, that's not a very reliable process because each of the humans may be wrong in more than a few cases. Instead, the training and test set annotation data is created by asking multiple radiologists and taking a majority vote on their decisions. So now that the training and test data is reliable, we can properly benchmark a human versus a neural network. And here's the result. This learning algorithm outperforms the average human radiologist. The performance was measured in a 2D space where sensitivity and specificity were the two interesting metrics. Sensitivity means the proportion of positive samples that were classified as positive, and specificity means the portion of negative samples that were classified as negative. The crosses mean the human doctors, and as you can see, whichever radiologist we look at, even though they have very different false positive and negative ratios, they are all located below the blue curve, which denotes the results of the learning algorithm. This is a simple diagram. But if you think about what it actually means, this is an incredible application of machine intelligence. So in this case, they're able to do things that are as good uh, or perhaps better than a radiologist in identifying um, from a new x-ray the potential for pneumonia. So this is an area that we see a lot of development in. So uh, any type of thing where you're analyzing an image. So this is an, uh, another example here um, where uh, they're using this for mammograms on uh, breast cancer. And so able to detect um, breast cancer, uh, not only more accurately, but perhaps more quickly. That's another area that's very interesting in pathology. So uh, I'm sure some of you have had loved ones or God forbid yourself that have had to have a biopsy of some sort and had to wait for a pathology report. Well, what happens during that waiting time? Are you feeling kind of relaxed about that? Uh, not really, you're not sleeping well. Um, you're not um, uh, you know, able to concentrate as well. Maybe your health is actually gonna decline because you're so worried. So uh, what's interesting about this is it's not necessarily replacing the pathologist, but the AI algorithm can actually look through 
lots and lots of tissue samples 24 hours a day. Their, their eyes don't get tired. Uh, they don't get distracted. They're not thinking about you know, something that happened with their girlfriend or something like that, that a human might. And they're able to sort through a lot of the data quickly and then identify in this case uh, that you can see that little dot that's around the um, one area of the slide uh, that's been highlighted by a machine learning algorithm that's saying, hey, the doctor should look here. There's something suspicious going on here. Okay, so it's been able to uh, increase the um, turnaround time, if you will, for uh, this type of diagnosis. Now, uh, there's been over, over 50 uh, algorithms that have been approved. Uh, for use in the U.S. by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration for use on humans for diagnostics. And uh, they can uh, range from all sorts of medical diagnostics to actually figuring out which patients are not going to show up for their appointment. Okay? So we might know that you know, people like Scott do not tend to show up for their appointments on time. Uh, whereas uh, Thomas is always prompt and uh, there on time. So uh, that's kind of interesting how this is being used. And what gets really even more interesting is when we start to combine artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence with other things, such as Internet of Things, which is these small little inexpensive microprocessors that collect environmental data and transmit that data to a central server. Uh, central server for analysis or decision making. Okay, so that's where things can get really interesting as you start to combine artificial intelligence with some other technologies. And let's go ahead and do that. I have a little device here from a company called Cardia. Uh, it's a little Internet of Things device. It has just two pads. So it's kind of hard to see because I've got the green screen. It's got just two pads. Uh, and it's got uh, another pad on the back. And what this does is it transmits uh, um, the basically electrical properties of my skin to my phone. And um, once again, I'm going to kind of uh, attempt a live demo here. And um, we will um, see how we can do um, with uh, recording my EKG. And then we'll talk about how this AI would play into this. Okay, so let me see here. I might need to take this off and plug it back in again. There we go. Okay, so this is my phone. Um, and it's telling me, whoops, let me connect it again. This is my phone. It's telling me to uh, go ahead and touch these two electrodes. It can see that I'm doing that. And then I'm going to um, actually, uh, this is a little risque for a University of Western Cape event, I know Lana, but I'm going to actually pull up my sock here and I'm going to um, now touch that back one to my leg. And I'm gonna be quiet for 30 seconds. Okay, so um, that wasn't the best because I was moving around a little bit, but this has actually taken my EKG. It's um, a, what we call six lead EKG. Um, and if any of you have ever had to have like a halter monitor or something like that on where they monitor your heart for a long period of time, um, you can see that something like this is much easier to deal with, right? So this is less than $100 US, very simple device, doesn't have any intelligence built into it. But then this can be uploaded um, from my phone and it can actually detect things such as my potassium levels, okay? So by having people that have a known potassium levels and uh, looking at their EKGs, they've been able to train a machine learning algorithm to um, recognize people's um, potassium levels from that, okay? So there's lots of different ways that this technology can kind of be combined. 
Okay, so um, uh, that's kind of an interesting um, thing. I can also then send this off to my doctor uh, and it can be combined with some of the other technologies such as uh, having a little Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something like that. And um, those devices can alert you that, hey, Scott, your, your heart rate's high. Um, why don't you go ahead and take an EKG right now? Okay, so it's kind of interesting the way these technologies can be combined. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, some of the other combinations we can have. And um, let's look at how audio and voice data can be processed. Now you may recognize that your computer or these other devices, Siri and whatnot, can actually recognize your voice. They just do that by collecting training data. Uh, they collect a lot of people pronouncing different words. They analyze and segment that. They've trained a neural network, tested it out, and that's how you're able to do, for example, voice to text translation. Uh, there's actually a new feature on Zoom, which we'll try to do this using an AI as well. So we can definitely have a computer understand our voice. Um, and we can even uh, interact with computers through our voice. So some of you I'm sure have been subject to the dreaded phone tree where you are uh, popped, uh, you call somebody for customer service for your wireless and they say press two if you want this, press three if you want that. And it kind of goes through these if then types of situations or you can often just say things to them. So I, I need help with billing or um, I need help with uh, traveling abroad. This is a company called Trello. This is just a little map of how you actually build these things, or not Trello, it's uh, Twillow. Sorry about that. But um, these systems sometimes don't uh, interact with humans uh, in the same way that a human would. But I want to show you this video here and then see what you all think about it. Uh, this is from uh, Google. It's actually a little bit uh, old, but it shows you uh, what they're aiming to do with giving the computer a voice. Thanks, Lillian. It's great to see the progress with the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our assistant is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. So I should have explained this at the beginning, but the little colored circles are the computer at Google and the 
person there, uh, the gray person on the right is the actual uh, human, if you will. Have a great day, bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I help you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people when? Um, Day, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like upper like uh, five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. So what do you think of that? Let me see. Drew, what do you think of that? Uh, it's... It's a little creepy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, it, it's it's fascinating. Like, it's definitely um, uh, it, it's impressive that that the machine was able to kind of you know go with the flow there. Right. So it's able to uh, uh, figure out. It's been trained on scheduling appointments. Okay. So it's it is still kind of narrow AI. Okay. If we start having it, uh, you know, do something else like. God forbid, teach a class. Um, it probably let's hope it would not be able to do that, or you know, I'm out of a job in a year. But uh, it would uh, um, be able to schedule something. So it's been is it, once again, so it's narrow. Okay. Um, but think about all the things that you do when you schedule appointments. It's very repetitive, right? Think about all the things you do when you chat with a chat bot. Now, I'm sorry, this gentleman here that has this video on at T S H E P O. Could you uh, let, tell us what you think about this? You're, you're muted right now, but unmute and tell, tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking here. Yes. Mm, yes. Tipple. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Tipple, yeah. Okay. We, there you go. For me, uh, for me, I, I find it more like uh, fascinating because it's a new thing that uh, I'm starting to see it now. Uh, it's a new information and it's a new, uh, new knowledge. And I'm saying like, I'm so surprised as to how like uh, a person can manage to do such an incredible thing because it's indeed an incredible thing. That's what I can say for now. So would you want to know if that was a computer calling you? I beg your pardon? Would you want to know or if a computer was calling? Yes. Uh, I would want to know that whether it, it was a computer that was calling or not. But I I, I held the know. I'm just so surprised. <laughs> so maybe we would have the University of West Virginia um, have their admissions. Uh, I'm going to mute you right now. I'm getting a little bit of a feedback, but maybe we would have the University of Western Cape reach out and remind you to register for classes, right? So that might be something that's kind of repetitive. We would have a lot of data that we could train our machine learning algorithm, okay? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about um, 
some of the security and ethics as we're going, we're starting to kind of get into that area. But there's always kind of an area where we kind of tip this balance, right? Between convenience, that's, boy, that's nice and convenient, right? I don't have to mess around with getting the restaurant reservation, but it's also kind of creepy, right? So we get to that creepy part. Yeah, Lana, did you have, you had your hand up, I saw that. Yeah, I was just, um, there was a question earlier that I thought we could quickly slip in, it was, it was around um, Jacques Francel asked, what course or qualification who do you recommend, um, you know, someone completes who's interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence as a, as a career? As a career. Um, so if you are, uh, you know, interested in this and actually programming uh, these types of systems, you're going to need to have a good background in math. Uh, and uh, maths, and you're going to uh, need some background in computer science. There are a number of courses you can take uh, through Coursera as well as some others. And I will try to uh, have a resource list um, that I'll provide to you all uh, at the end. And I will add um, specifically some of those that I think are, are really good. Okay, so there are ways to kind of get a little bit of um, certification. IBM has several uh, that you can take relatively cheaply, um, you know, for, uh, um, oh, you know, $40 US. Okay, so relatively cheap courses. Um, and they actually have you program their AI named Watson. Okay, so they actually have you do that. So it gives you some hands-on experience um, and I'll, I'll provide some of those, yeah. Other questions or, yeah. Brian wants to know, um, yeah, why are things so bad, right? So a lot of the people that are um, calling us are maybe not using the quality of the AI of Google because maybe they're trying to scam us sometimes, right? So that's another problem. Um, yeah, so. Irina, what do, what do you think about this as far as, uh, do you think it's, uh, would you want to know if that was an AI calling you? You're, you're muted, you can unmute there. Hello, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I'm just a little bit uh, surprised with, um, uh, it's not surprise, it's just a little bit of a uh, situation of shock because it's true. It's very convenient to, for communication because you save your emotional, uh, your uh, neuros, uh, neuro system, uh, sorry, neurological system as you, uh, with peace. Right. Machine is decided for you how to have a dialogue with a quite, uh, maybe not perfectly qualified person, receptionist. So she sorted out nicely with uh, quite uh, unstandard situation. Five people, seven people, four people, different age, different, um, uh, numbers, but uh, it is a huge problem if you would like to know if you're dealing with non-human voice. Right. Uh, I will. I will think about this next days because it's ethical ethical issue. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, yeah, let's. It's an ethical issue on how we use it. Now, there's um, in the U.S. politics sometimes things get a little bit nasty, and we just actually had a uh, election yesterday for our, our local city, our local municipality. Uh, and sometimes politicians will use something called push polls. Okay, so this is where someone would call you and they would, uh, I'm gonna pick on some of my friends here. Um, let's say that Jackie Rasmussen and I, uh, we have really gotten interested in politics lately. And so we're probably gonna be running against each other. This is, this is just an announcement for anybody in Columbia. We're probably gonna be running against each other in two years for mayor, okay? So I think that's, that's pretty much guaranteed. Uh, and uh, what's gonna happen is uh, Jackie's gonna try and get Shannon's vote and I'm gonna try and get Shannon's vote. Uh, but what we could do is we could use an algorithm to find out, you know, what is Shannon all about? Well, it turns out that she is a lover of hedgehogs, just like any right thinking person. She loves hedgehogs. And so Dra Jackie might do something underhanded. I wouldn't put this past her uh, to uh, have a machine learning algorithm that would call Shannon and say, uh, well, Shannon, are you planning to vote in the April election? And she would say, yes. And then this push poll would say, uh, are you, who are you voting for? And she said, well, I'm voting for Scott. And uh, then it would say, well, would it change your mind if you knew that Scott hates hedgehogs? 
we did uh, change your mind to know that he wants to make hedgehogs illegal in the city of Columbia for everybody. Do we really want the hedgehog police coming to your door? Okay, that would be a lie, but in the US, we have kind of a thing where we protect political speech, including lies, okay? But only Shannon would get that message, okay? So that was what the big controversy was about with Facebook four years ago or five years ago, because those micro-targeted ads were never seen by anybody else. So no newspaper would ever hear this push poll, okay? And so that's a, a big problem. So um, yeah, let's continue to, to talk about this and get into the area of ethics um, for a little bit. I'm, I'm continually refreshing the uh, demo page that I wanted to use, but uh, it may not uh, work. Uh, yeah, so does machine learning take place on a Google call? Where does it train on the call? Um, that's interesting because if you actually look at the, um, like if you use Siri or you use, uh, I don't want to say the G word because I have one of those devices over here and it'll start doing things. <laughs> but uh, if you use that uh, uh, assistant that is uh, from the company uh, that starts with a G, um, in the user agreement, it says that it will listen and capture audio for training purposes. So somebody was asking about different accents, right? So they will actually train and get better uh, on some of this stuff. So another uh, area that's of a huge interest is this idea of um, uh, in AI and ethics is this idea of autonomous vehicles. Okay, so autonomous vehicles, vehicles that can drive themselves. Now, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, there's really five like levels of autonomous vehicles. So the first one would be like, uh, oh, when you're about to change lanes, it, t it tells you you're about to hit somebody, it warns you. So it doesn't necessarily take action, but it warns the driver. <clears throat> at the other end, at level five, it's fully autonomous, okay? So at no point is a human driving or even able to take over. So at level four, a human is able to take over. <clears throat> so um, it's kind of interesting. This is actually being tested out in different places. This is a short video from uh, Shenzhen, China, where they've been uh, deploying level five cars. Hello, welcome to Shenzhen, the Silicon Valley of China. Today, I'm going to take a ride with a completely driverless robot taxi driving on regular public roads. Let's go. And here it comes. The fully driverless robot taxi is making a U-turn to come and pick me up. As we can see, the AutoX self-driving system is completely integrated within the vehicle platform. And this is why I can put my luggage here without any problems. This is a level 4, a level 5, fully driverless robot taxi from AutoX, the leading self-driving car company in China. This is a Chrysler Pacifica minivan equipped with high-resolution cameras, high-resolution lighters, and long-range radars. Because it is a fully driverless vehicle, the car also has a surrounding blind spot perception system on each side of the car, including both wide-angle lighters and cameras. Here is the button to open the door. Now I'm inside the self-driving car. The driver's seat is empty. The passenger seat is empty. The second and third rows are all empty. I'm in the car all by myself. This is so nice. Okay, now I'm all buckled up and I'm going to click the button to go. Okay, it's letting me close the door. I'm going to click this button and the door will close.
车辆即将开始行驶，请做好并系紧安全带。Now we have switched the gear from P to D, and the handbrake is off. Now we're driving completely driverlessly. 
Yeah, so that's uh, Anton makes a really good point there. Uh, and uh, uh, so does a, a previous person, Takri. Um, yeah, I really said so. Tariq asked a Tariq asked a question, and then a follow up question. Um, we can maybe yeah, I'll read his one. Uh, will self driving vehicles become the future of roadworthy vehicles globally? And then he asked a follow up question: like, What happens if the self driving vehicle malfunctions uh, while driving on the road? Mm -hmm. So what's probably going to happen is the liability is going to shift to the manufacturer. And in fact, I believe there's a couple of manufacturers, I think maybe it was Volvo that was the first one to say this that said, no, actually it's VW, um, Volkswagen, uh, that said that they would um, be the ones to accept the liability. So I wouldn't, if my car was in a self-driving mode, um, I would not accept the liability or would not have to carry liability insurance. Instead, it would be uh, uh, the manufacturer that would have the liability, okay? And so that's where uh, things are gonna shift uh, as well because I wouldn't be in control of the vehicle. It would be how it was programmed, how it was maintained. Um, you may expect self-driving cars to maybe even not uh, turn on if they have a maintenance problem, right? So I may be low, I may have a, a semi-flat tire, my brakes may be about to go out, but I still get in my car and get on the roadway, right? When I probably shouldn't. Uh, maybe a self-driving car will say, no, you know, we're not going anywhere until you fix the brakes um, and, uh, and uh, so forth and so on. So it's very interesting to see how this is going to um, uh, happen. And Brian says, yeah, we could program these uh, vehicles to actually recognize um, better routes to take so they can actually talk to each other. So I think it, there's an enormous potential. Um, do you need to have a car? Well, in the US, we kind of identify ourselves with cars, but frankly, um, when I was working in my small business, I was driving 30 to 40,000 miles a year, and I've had my fill of driving. I would love to be able to get into a self-driving car that I don't own and you know, get my sandwich and, and uh, coffee and tell it to drive me to Chicago because I want to see a show tonight, okay? Uh, and then take a nap and read a book on the way. Um, so I think there's going to be some cultural shift. I think younger people are maybe a little more used to this sharing economy where they don't identify that, oh, I have this car and therefore I am, uh, it's part of my identity. Yeah, so uh, that's very, very interesting. Well, a car transportation shift to a subscription model. And that's what a lot of people are thinking. Um, you could have self-driving cars um, that would be working 24 seven. The idea is that we need less cars overall. So you think about Uber or Lyft, and those are now uh, self-driving cars. They're no longer owned by individuals. Okay, so some people think, oh, well, if you had enough money and you might buy a car that has self-driving capabilities, you might then, when you're not using it, have it go out and make money for you, right? So do some um, uh, driving other people around. Whereas other people think, well, it's going to be Uber or Lyft. They're going to have fleets of self-driving cars. I met a gentleman that's really into cryptocurrency. His name is Andreas Ananopoulos. He talked with my class. Um, and he has proposed, why does the self-driving car even need an owner? Okay, so what if you just set a self-driving car out there? It could collect uh, fees in Bitcoin or whatever it is. It could have smart contracts to get upgrades in the future. Um, would you even need an owner? So the things can get pretty wild here. I think we're starting to enter science fiction uh, areas. Yeah, so make use of petrol. Yeah, they can be either. They can be uh, um, either uh, petrol or they can be uh, hybrid or electric. Um, Scott, I'd like to just quickly um, draw attention to Anton's question a bit earlier. Um, it's a bit of a, a long one. It's a comment and then a, a question if you want to quickly scan it. Um, yeah, so uh, Anton is right. It's uh, the difficulty there is often cleaning the data. So there is um, uh, some problems with not only have, having biased data, 
um, but also having um, clean data. Okay, so uh, that's what you'd really need is you need to make sure that um, are you identifying just cats and are do cats include lions? They're kind of a feline, right? So they're part of that whole family. Um, or are you wanting to identify just a tabby cat? Okay, so yeah, you're going to have to level, have your specificity. You're going to have to have more training data uh, if you actually want to, um, uh, how you want to do that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, infrastructure is interesting. Uh, are we, we're actually going through a process right now of debating the infrastructure bill that our president Joe Biden has put forward. Uh, are we going to just rebuild the same stuff? Or are we going to rebuild roads in a way that is ready for self-driving cars? Yeah, that's, a, oh, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that, Andre. Um, I, I had kind of forgotten to uh, mention this. These, uh, yeah, these computers, that are doing the self-driving, they have to be contained within the car itself because you can't be barreling along the road and then have, oh, the cellular network went down, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden um, your car is saying, okay, Scott, you take over, right? Uh, so actually um, these computers are uh, contained within the car. Tesla makes their own. Uh, NVIDIA, which is a very popular manufacturer of microprocessors and specifically graphics cards um, makes a system called the drive. So for about $20,000, you can buy the computer that will do everything it needs to create a self-driving car. Okay, so uh, yeah, you need to have that intelligence on board. Now it certainly will connect up to the network, share other data. Okay. Yeah, will the driver be allowed to take over? That's interesting. Well, um, right now, certain regulations, even for a level five self-driving cars, say that you still have to have a steering wheel. Okay, so you still would be able to take over. I think we're gonna see a country by country um, uh, response to this. Now, it's interesting, I have a, a, a former student, Aaron Peterman, who works at Boeing, and he works uh, over in St. Louis in some of their R&D areas, and he tells me that it's likely that they will have drones that will be able to transport people uh, before we have self-driving cars, and the reason he says that is because people don't always follow the rules of the road. Okay, so uh, let's say that I arrive at a stop sign at the same time that Drew arrives at a stop sign. Um, in the US, we would say that um, there's certain rules, but let's just say we were side by side that uh, are coming at angles there, uh, that uh, the person on the right would go first. Okay, and so Drew's there on the right, he should go first, but he sees me, he says, oh, that's Professor Christensen, and he waves me through, okay? Well, how's the self-driving car gonna deal with that? Okay, we do all sorts of things that we're not supposed to do. We, we pass on the right when we're not supposed to pass on the right or pass on the left. Um, and uh, so humans don't always follow the rules. However, people that fly have to follow the rules. So if you are an American Airlines pilot and you see your buddy who's on Southwest, you don't say, oh, go ahead and land. You go ahead and land first, right? You don't do that. You follow the rules if you're gonna remain a pilot. And so he's convinced that that's what we're gonna see first. So I don't know, that's what we started out this session with, what's the future? Uh, that's what we wanna know. And it's, uh, it's hard to predict, how do we want that future to uh, come about? Okay. Well, let's talk, um, I was still checking uh, this website. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of good questions there um, uh, about data and about privacy. Uh, this is the, the website I was trying to get loaded here. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to load by the end of the class um, here today, but this is one where we can actually train an AI with our phones. So what I will do is I will make a little um, recording after this comes up and we'll send it out to you all so that you can try it on your own. This is actually a live site where you can use your phone to collect data. So uh, your phone has accelerometer in it and we can collect data about whether you're waving or whether you're doing circles. And you can actually train this AI 
um, through a website uh, to be able to detect whether somebody's doing waves or whether they're doing circles. Okay, so it doesn't look like we'll be able to, to come back to that, uh, but let's go ahead and let's uh, talk about a few other areas of uh, use of AI where we may have some questions and where there may be some problems. So what if I was to, uh, uh, I don't know, I think my dean is on here, I better not say this too loudly, but uh, uh, what if I was to say, well, you know, this whole grading stuff, <sighs> kind of a pain, uh, why don't I just train an AI to do my grading for me? Okay, I could take all the papers that got A's in the past, and I could take all the papers that got uh, B's in the past, or C's, or D's, and I could just train that AI. And so that way, when uh, Drew turns in his next paper, um, I could just turn that over to the AI and say, well, Drew, uh, you got a B, okay? Or you got an A, or you got whatever grade. Well, what do you think, Drew? Are you ready to do that, or um, is that okay? Well, I mean, it, I, think, I think it would help me with TAing, definitely. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure that I would feel as comfortable if it was me, the one being graded. Um, I, I think I'd trust you more than the AI. Right. Now, I may have biases, and there are some ways to deal with that. So, for example, when I do grade papers, I, I take off the names, so I don't want to see the names of who I'm grading, and our, our learning management system does that, and um, because I don't want to know that, oh, you know, uh, I like Drew, I don't like Drew, I don't want that bias to creep into there. Um, so there, there are biases in humans. I, I'm, I'm biased. I try to do everything I can to limit that bias. Uh, but let's say that Drew is the next, uh, you know, he's uh, the next uh, Ernest Hemingway or, or Virginia Woolf or um, uh, Truman Capote or Mark Twain. He's going to introduce an entirely new way of writing and, and uh, a new genre of uh, writing. And I'm his English professor. Well, uh, he might get an F because it's not going to fit the previous patterns. Okay. And so I would say that that is not, even if it worked, even if it worked fairly well, that would not be an ethical use of that type of system. Okay. And we actually have on here, uh, Leonardo is a PhD student, is actually working with uh, OpenAI. Anton just mentioned OpenAI. And um, uh, is actually been able to train AIs to write uh, literature. Uh, Leonardo, are you still on? Do you want to tell a little bit about what you experimented with there? If I see him. Uh, he may have had to drop off for a class, but he's actually able to um, feed in um, literature from a um, uh, Latin American author and able to get out a story that looks very similar to that. Okay, so that's uh, AI and ethics. Well, Hopefully my students start, don't start using AI to write their papers. I know that a lot of students use Grammarly. Um, and I, uh, if you haven't used Grammarly, I use it. Uh, so if I am going to send an email out, um, I have a hard time of seeing my mistakes when I first write something. If I let it sit for a day, uh, I can usually see those mistakes and correct them myself. But I will sometimes use Grammarly to point out where I have the, the, or I have some other obvious mistake. And that uses AI as well. Okay, so there's some ethical considerations there. Um, uh, what about loans and credit? Would we actually want um, a, a, an AI to figure out whether we should receive a loan? Okay, well, in the US, we've had some problems with that. We've had uh, racial profiling, gender, um, and uh, racial biases in how we have given loans. So if we were to actually train an AI with that data, we'd end up with an AI that had a bias in it. Okay, so that uh, is probably not a good use as well. That's called redlining sometimes, where we'd actually look at zip codes, uh, and those would be kind of redlined areas where you wouldn't give loans to. Okay. Um, now, once again, I think some of the people that are trying to do these uh, AI applications are doing it because they um, 
have good intentions. They're trying to eliminate human bias, but often they're just introducing other ones. Uh, we mentioned social media before, um, and social media is uh, an area that uh, machine learning has been deployed extensively to keep us on those sites, right? So it's gonna keep us engaged and it can actually develop a profile of our behavior and know when we're most likely to be subject to an ad, when we're most likely to uh, be able to uh, engage in something to stay on the site, what kind of content. So that's been um, problematic to say the least. What if we get into areas like warfare? Should we use AI in warfare? Well, unfortunately, AI is becoming kind of democratized. You remember that I said that we could uh, train an AI and we could download it into something like this, a very, very small device. Um, because of that, um, unfortunately, you could have a lot of bad actors that don't have to have a big budget in order to develop something that is lethal. And so there's been a lot of talk recently about drone swarms. So what if you could uh, put out 5,000 drones that were kind of kamikaze, uh, if you will, and they would then be able to attack people or attack infrastructure or attack bases, okay? And those might have some AI to help guide them. Uh, if you're interested in uh, how AI is being used uh, you know, in good applications, there's a company called Skydio, uh, and that's uh, an interesting uh, company because uh, they can, have developed a drone that can follow you around. Even if you run through the trees and run through the bushes, it will follow you. Um, so the military is actually getting concerned about this and is starting to say that um, how uh, we may actually have to turn over the ability to fight to these AIs if we're going to combat these types of things. There's one last topic I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to kind of leave that open-ended, but I'm just saying that this is a concern. And that is the fact that these AIs are in some ways black boxes. I have here my little black box to show you. Um, it, it's uh, just to illustrate that we can't see inside what's going on in these things, right? So if you think about uh, an AI, you think about those hidden layers I told you about. So what's going on in there? that's sometimes kind of a mystery because we're letting the machine figure out what's going on. We just care if it's able to predict things accurately, okay? So um, sometimes these hidden layers, uh, because we don't know what's going on, leads us to be able to trick these AIs. So let me give you an example here. We've been talking about self-driving cars and we've got a lot of good questions about self-driving um, uh, cars. Um, but Google had a self-driving car that they taught it what a stop sign looks like. Now, how did they do that? Well, just as I talked about at the beginning with money, they just showed it lots and lots of images of stop signs. And so Google got really good at identifying stop signs. But because of this kind of black box phenomenon, they didn't really know what was it really deciding made a stop sign a stop sign. And some researchers found that they took these stop signs and they put some graffiti or stickers on them. That car would decide that the stop sign was either a uh, speed limit is 45 mile an hour or a yield sign. Okay. So that's a big problem, right? Because I don't know about where you all are living, but here in Columbia, we often have uh, people that have put stickers and things like that on the stop signs. And I wouldn't want my self-driving car to now be barreling through the stop sign at 45 miles an hour and causing an accident. Um, but this is where, once again, AI right now is very narrow in scope. Okay, so remember we talked about that in the beginning, that uh, AI can be very narrow. Uh, and so it's a good at identifying a stop sign that doesn't have any graffiti on it. This has uh, since been improved. And what researchers are trying to do in this field known as adversarial AI is they're trying to get a look into those hidden layers. And if you think about the difference between a human and an AI, uh, a small human, a child, 
will be able to notice that the vehicle comes to a stop when any one of these little things that are red are up there. So they know their colors. They know that's red. They know that it's shaped like an octagon. They know that they know their letters. So they know S-T-O-P. Uh, they know that word. Okay. So they're able to take other areas of expertise and apply it into understanding what a traffic sign is. Okay. And AI is not going to be able to do that. It's very good at the pattern recognition that it's been given, but it can sometimes be tricked. This is um, uh, something that I thought was pretty funny here. Uh, they, uh, somebody was asking about training AIs on cats. Uh, this is one that uh, an AI was trained on various um, animals. And so in this case, they had a clean example and they uh, introduced just a little bit of noise into the signal. And you can't even, the human eye can't even detect that. But now it is, uh, saying that there was, uh, is this gone from a 75% chance that this is a tiger cat to a 56% prob 56 probability that this is an Egyptian cat. Um, so this is a giant panda with 100% confidence. We introduced some uh, background noise into the picture and uh, we now have the AI saying with 49% confidence that this is an American black bear. And this one I thought was great. Uh, this is a pig, definitely a pig, 100%. We add a little noise to the picture and uh, the AI identifies this as an airliner. Okay, so kind of has an airliner look to it, but um, I would say that uh, I wouldn't try to fly that thing to South Africa. Um, but this is this whole area of air adversarial AI where we're trying to get a look into what's happening in these black boxes. We're also trying to understand what biases might be involved in these things. Okay, so um, uh, there have also been biases that have been racial bias found in uh, facial recognition. Okay, in fact, there's been three uh, um, people that have been detained in the US based on their identification by facial recognition algorithms. Well, they all turned out to be black or African-American. Okay, so it turns out that um, these algorithms may be very good on the data they're trained on, white or Asian males, and they're not very good on other types of data. Okay, there's, a, there's a good movie on Netflix called Coded Bias. Uh, if you have an opportunity to watch that, it's a researcher from uh, MIT and she's an African-American woman and found out that she could not program uh, the AI to recognize her own face. Okay, so, and it went from there. Yeah, cybersecurity and AI, that's a whole uh, topic. Um, that's also one uh, where we start to see AI being used by hackers and AI being used by our white hat hackers that are um, also uh, trying to combat those things. Now, I'll give you one, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up here, I know some folks have to go. Um, I'll give you one or two resources here. This is learnabout.ai. So this is a website that I maintain that is um, um, contains just AI links, okay? And I will put some more after this class. Um, I will also put in, uh, Lana's put the next webinar and hopefully all my technology will work then. Um, I will also put in uh, my slides. So if you want all the slides, uh, I put that in the chat and I think we're gonna be sending out a, uh, email to everybody uh, that's here and that's registered uh, with uh, these links as well. Uh, but if you want, you can go to this website, just learnabout.ai, there's no .com or anything. And I have a number of different courses there uh, that I recommend and different programs. So with that, I'll see, we've got about 10 minutes or so left. I'll see if there's any questions or anything else you guys want to explore. And thank you for being a, a very patient audience. Um, I'm sure as soon as we end the Zoom call, the little uh, site that I was going to use for the demo will will come back up. So, by the way, Scott, I uh, I ended up watching Silicon Valley. I love that show, it, and it, the, like some of the things you were mentioning, like kind of like you know triggered that you know with the AI and like the compression software that you know that they combine.
Yeah, so uh, uh, that uh, Silicon Valley, if you know a lot of uh, history about uh, Silicon Valley startups, um, you will recognize, oh, that's this company. <laughs> oh, that's this person. Uh, this is personality. They basically uh, fictionalized uh, the history of uh, Silicon Valley in a lot of ways. So good. Uh, yeah, so uh, Craig, you'll actually find that on the uh, Learn About Day dot AI site, um, but that is called, um, uh, let me double check it here. It always it starts to make noise, so I tend to quit it fairly uh, often. It's called Seeing, seeing AI, like, uh, let me type it in here. Yeah, so the setup of a neural network. Um, so what happens is, is when you start to think about it, if you have a neural network that is uh, very, very complex. So this is just a very basic system I'm showing here. But imagine this being hundreds of layers, each with hundreds of neurons each. Um, it's very hard to really understand all the, if you just work out the combiner, combinarial the combinations that are possible, uh, you'll find that there's a huge number of combinations that could, could be happening in here. Um, a lot of the AIs there are trying to look at what's going on inside of this. So trying to understand that. Okay, but we're basically letting it um, uh, figure it out on its own. Is AI good in learning and understanding economic trends? Well, I actually have a book that was given to me by my nephew as to how I get, program, program an AI for investing and get rich. Um, I haven't done that yet, but uh, certainly uh, there is um, a number of places that do this. So TradeBot is a company out of Kansas City that a lot of our students go to work for. And they're one of these so-called high frequency traders. So they have computer algorithms that are trading stock within fractions of a millisecond, okay? or actually maybe three or four milliseconds. Okay? Uh, and they're doing this because they can make just a tiny, tiny little bit of money. But if you do that billions of times an hour, that, that money adds up. So in fact, um, uh, that's being used in stock trading. Uh, some people don't like that. I tend not to like that. I think that's not uh, a great application of technology. As far as bigger economic trends, I would say in some ways, but I would say there's also some difficulty there uh, because um, of the complexity of the systems you're dealing with. Right? So there's a lot of complexity uh, of what goes into economic trends. Okay, there's politics, there's... Uh, um, you know, financial policy, there's all sorts of stuff. So I think that would be difficult to determine uh, on, on your own. Cool. So um, yeah, I'm happy to, to hang out here for a couple more minutes and geek out, but um, I look for a follow-up email and um, please join us on July 14th, where we'll be really looking at um, some models to how to understand uh, technology, how to understand technological change. Uh, and we'll be looking at just a whole host of technologies and kind of how they get combined together in these interesting new ways. And I hope to talk a little bit about what's going on right now um, in cryptocurrency. Um, those of you know about probably Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, but uh, there's also been a lot of noise lately about NFTs or NFTs. Uh, this is a way that you might sell digital art. So we might talk about that a little bit in that session. And we might also talk about central bank digital currencies and what's happening with maybe the dollar becoming digital and with other currencies becoming digital. We're actually seeing that progressing really rapidly. So please join us next time. Uh, it's once again a free webinar on July 14th. So Dogecoin, yeah. I don't think I'll talk about Dogecoin. <laughs> so, okay, well, it's very great seeing you all and um, uh, take care.
<clears throat> All right. Let's see here. Lana, I'm going to, uh, and I don't see anybody has other questions. Sometimes I think people get up and, uh, <clears throat> oh, Matthew, yeah, um, you certainly can uh, build AI for news. There's a really good um, book by Francisco Marconi called um, Newsmakers. Okay. And they actually do a, a lot of uh, company reports about earnings. Those are actually uh, designed in the Wall Street Journal. They're actually written by an AI. Okay. So um, you can actually uh, uh, see that in the byline, it will actually say that it's written by an AI. Cool. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end the call, but it was great to see you all. Great to see you, Austin. I saw Austin on here, oh, he just dropped off. So um, otherwise, we'll talk to you later.